Hello and welcome to the webinar on the model for sustainability. Sustainability forms a key part of all of the network programmes that we deliver, so the information contained in this webinar should be relevant to you, no matter which of our networks you are a member of. Sustainability sits alongside the other pillars of our programme, such as Plan, Do, Study, Act, experience-based design and measurement for improvement, as we discussed on the previous webinar, Getting Off to a Flying Start. The webinar today looks at why we undertake a sustainability assessment. What we're aiming to do is make sure that the changes that you're making, the improvements that you're putting in place are sustainable in the longer term so that they move from being an improvement project to business as usual. We want those improvements to become embedded into your processes and to then become resilient to any further changes that might happen. We're going to look at some examples of general models for sustainability, and then we'll look at the sustainability tool that we use as part of our networks. We'll look at how it works to determine areas that potentially need development, areas of weakness that you can then focus on to ensure that your project is a success going forward. We're going to start off with a question. And I'd like to ask you, what percentage of improvements projects do you think are not sustained going forward? Is it 10%? Is it 25%? Is it 30%? Is it 50%? Or is it 70%? It may not come as a surprise that the answer is actually 70% of all improvement projects that are started are not sustained in the longer term. As you can imagine, that has impacts on time, resources, costs, staffing and morale and can cause frustrations. I'm sure we have all have worked in organisations where we have started improvement projects, a lot of time and effort and energy has gone into making those improvements and they have only lasted for the period of the project and then not been sustained going forward. However, this is not just a problem within the NHS. Where does this 70% figure come from? Well, if we look externally to the NHS, PwC looked at 200 different companies that ran over 10,000 projects during a year from those projects, only 2.5% actually delivered the business benefits that they have been identified to do at the beginning. Again, Daft and No, in a piece of work from 2000, came up with evidence of a failure rate of as much as 70% in projects sustaining their efforts in the longer term. And again, another study that showed that Fortune 100 company success rates were reported to be between 20 and 50 percent. So, how can we do our best to ensure that the improvements that we are making are sustainable going forward in the longer term? We know that we will never be able to have a 100 percent success rate, but what can we do to make sure that we are as certain as we possibly can be that the changes we're making will be sustainable. This is where the sustainable, sustainability model comes in. So a quote here from George Box, statistician, that says all models are wrong, but some are useful. And that's just to remind us that what we're talking about here is just a model. There will be others that are used. Say so we use a particular one within our network programmes, but there are others that exist. They won't be perfect, they won't be 100% accurate. But what we want is something that applies to the everyday. So it won't be perfect, but it is a useful tool. So here we have a stool and Bob Willard, who was a sustainability champion, came up with this stool analogy to look at society and quality of life. The different aspects that we have here are economic, are environmental and social. And you can see under each of these different legs of the stool, there are various different elements that help make up a balanced society and quality of life. What it's saying is here is that it's important to have balance. 
so that society doesn't fall over, etc. Um, there can be sometimes a fourth leg applied, which is cultural factors, but you understand the principle here. The only problem is that each of the factors are shown separately. Really, they need to overlap because we know that they have to come together to have that impact. They're also all an equal length so that the stool doesn't fall over. But that implies that they've all got the same weighting. And again, we know that that's not always true. So can we demonstrate this idea of sustainability with different elements in a different way? So here we have instead overlapping circles. And we can also resize these depending on the influence or sway that they hold. So, for example, if you are working in finance, for, exe for example, you may make the economy circle bigger because that for you is where the biggest level of impact will be. The part in the middle there is where sustainability sits. We can also have a nested model. So society designs the econom economic model, but society itself is then swayed by and determined by a whole host of environmental factors that sit around it. They all have an influence on each other, and it's simply another way of demonstrating those three overlapping circles on the previous slide. McKinsey, so here at NH Select, we like to pinch with pride. This is McKinsey, uh, and there are, they came up with the three colours of operational excellence. We have operating systems here in red that look at your assets and resources. We have management infrastructure in blue, so these are your processes, structures and systems. And then in green, we have mindsets, capabilities and behaviours. So these are your hearts and minds, the way people feel and how they act in the workplace, both as an individual and as a group of people. You can see there that the overlapping is very different. They're not all the same, um, covering the same area. And it, but again, sustainability sits within the middle where all three overlap. With the three colours of operational excellence, if any of those aspects is missing, then the change will either fail or will not be as successful as it possibly can be. So to demonstrate, we have all three circles together. We can demonstrate continuous improvement. If we remove the red circle, which is your operating system, you end up with lots of positive thinking. You have your structures and processes in place and you have your hearts and minds, but you haven't got the resources to be able to do it. Therefore, positive thinking. If you remove the blue circle, which is your structures and processes, you have your assets and resources and you have the hearts and minds of the people but there are no structures and structures and processes to take it forward. Hence, it's referred to as headless chicken. And then finally, you can have your operating systems in place in red, your structures and processes in blue. But if you don't have the hearts and minds of the people with you, you have an unleadable army as such. So it's just a, a neat way of demonstrating how each of those elements are important in terms of making sure that your improvement project is going to be success as successful as it possibly can be. So what do we use here at NH Select? We use the NHS sustainability model. So well over 10 years ago now, the NHS Institute looked at existing sustainability models and whether these could be applied to healthcare. What they did then was worked with NHS frontline staff, doctors, nurses, clinicians, operational staff, managerial staff, etc. to take what already existed and to create something that would work specifically for us in the NHS. Hence the NHS sustainability model. And you can see there that we've still got the same three circles set up, this time looking at staff, processes and organisation. And each of those three circles has 10 criteria or factors that are linked to them in total. So this is the model that we use with NHS Select. 
and I'll describe how we use this and what we do with it in just a moment. But first, just a reminder that sustainability doesn't just happen. Sustainability of your improvement project is the result of effective preparation and implementation. You need to do your planning. Improvement programmes will only succeed if the same effort is put into their sustainability as their launch. As part of the core team, you're hopefully excited and motivated to make the improvements that you've identified uh, to make your service better. That enthusiasm and that eagerness to succeed needs to be put in to the sustainability part as well. We've worked with well over 100 trusts across the country um, and outside of England as well. And we have lots of evidence that where sites have prepared and planned before their implementation and they've looked at sustainability, they are more successful. So we look at sustainability at the beginning of a programme to get a baseline. And then we do it again towards the end of the programme to look at any changes that have been put in place. So how do you actually undertake a sustainability assessment and who do you do it with? We suggest using the whole range of stakeholders or as many as you possibly can. Obviously include your core team, your project team, but if you can include the range of stakeholders, you will get a much better idea of how sustainable your project really is. So I would suggest you refer back to your stakeholder mapping that we talked about as part of the Getting Off to a Flying Start webinar and make sure that you have done this with as many of your stakeholders as possible. And this is what we do. The sustainability model designed for use at a level of a specific planned or ongoing improvement project. So you need to be thinking about your aim and the project that you're undertaking at the moment. As I said, it's much better if you get lots of members of the team to do it, as well as other stakeholders that have an interest. The results then can be used as a diagnostic for the project lead to be incorporated into your action planning of areas that you're going to address. But it can also be really useful in terms of starting conversations with the whole team about their particular concerns or hopes for the future. Um, for example, once you've done your sustainability assessment, it may have flagged that clinical engagement is an issue. One example from a previous site was that teams found scored lowly on the clinical engagement. They use the sustainability report as a neutral way of sitting down with the team to discuss that clinical engagement. And it turns out that teams, the team were upset because the clinical lead didn't attend their team meetings. So they didn't feel that that clinical leadership was in place. Again, the project leads were able to go and speak to the particular clinician involved to take the report from sustainability with them to demonstrate where this had come up and have a neutral conversation around why this might have happened. The actual solution was is that the fortnightly team meetings were at the same time as a, a round that the clinical lead was doing and therefore regularly couldn't attend. By shifting the timings of the meetings slightly, the clinical lead could attend and that meant that the broader team then saw that the clinician was engaged with the program. So it can be something as simple as that, but it helps to start those conversations. So what do we do? The guide is a self-assessment. It's really easy to use. There are those 10 criteria or 10 factors that I referred to previously. It helps you understand the key barriers for sustainability, but then you're able to apply them to your local context and introduce some solutions into your action planning to ensure that your improvements are sustainable going forward. How do we do it? It's available on Slido, but we've also got a hard copy, paper-based copy of the tool, and it's also uh, available as an interactive Excel tool if you want to use it that way. This is what the Slido version looks like. We will provide you with a web address and a login. And there are 10 factors, 10 statements, 
And all we do is ask that the team responds A, B, C or D. So they agree with, agree with some of, disagree with most of or disagree with all of the statement that's provided. We would recommend that six or more members of your team complete the sustainability questions or respond to these questions. Below that, you won't really be getting a, an accurate picture of what sustainability looks like for you. So a minimum of six to complete. We will send you the web address and the login and it can be done on a phone, it can be done on a tablet, on a laptop, on a computer. So it's very simple and straightforward to do. The results then are automatically sent through to us and we can do the analysis. It's important to mention as well that it's anonymous. So if you're using Slido or any of the other methods, this is all anonymized. So it's based on an individual response, not a team one. It's anonymous. We then take all of the scores from across your team and we aggregate them up to create the sustainability report. If your program that you are participating in includes a site visit at the beginning of the program, this is where we will do the sustainability questionnaire with you. And the person from our team that's attending will talk you through the hows of doing this in more detail. We will then provide the report back to you as part of the feedback from the site visit. This is what the hard copy version looks like. It's a single side of A4, but it is the same as you have just seen on Slido, 10 factors and the team go through and individually say whether they agree with all of the statement, some of the statement or disagree, etc. And again, the Excel version looks like this. Whichever version of the tool you use, what will happen is it will produce, when we have aggregated all of the scores together from your team, it will provide you with a report and it will include this table. For each of the factors, it will give you the maximum score that was available. Now, if you remember, I said that the stool model was not great because the legs were all the same length. The maximum scores here you will see are different, which demonstrates how each of these factors has a greater or lesser impact on overall sustainability compared to each other. So the maximum scores will be slightly different. The next column then shows you the site average. So when we have aggregated all of the scores up for your team, this is how your team scored. And then the third column there is the gap. So between the, the site average and the maximum score available. That then produces these two graphs. So the one on the left, you can see for each of the particular 10 factors, the outline shows you the maximum score and then the solid block colored within that shows you the actual score from your team. We then take those with the biggest gap between maximum score and the actual score and arrange them in descending order from left to right. So as it says there, the gap between the average score and the maximum is ranked by decreasing gap. So the ones with the biggest gap will be on the left. We recommend that you focus on the first three, the first three factors on the left hand side. So in this case for A and other trust, that would be factor seven, factor six, and factor 10. So senior leadership, staff behaviors, and infrastructure. We don't recommend that you look at all 10 of the sustainability factors. It's distracting and it won't be helpful for you. If these are the three things that have come up for you as part of your sustainability assessment as being things to focus on, then focus on those three. We also give you an overall score. So you can see at the top of this slide, AN Other Trust has scored 70.7. So what does that mean? If you have a score of 55 or more, it demonstrates that there's a, a probability of a high level of sustainability with your project at the moment based on the responses from your team and how they feel about the improvement project. If you have a score of less than 45, we would advise you to pause your improvement project now and to address those key factors before moving forwards. 
between 45 and 55, continue with your project, but be aware that those elements need to be focused on and addressed to ensure that your project is as sustainable as possible. You can then weave those items into your action plan. So, for example, if clinical leadership was one of the areas that came up for you, your actions may be to identify a clinical lead, to agree with the clinical lead, the improvement plan you've put in place to make sure that they're involved in team meetings and to actually have a review and audit of the cases that are being seen by the service. Now, we can't give you the actions that you need to put in place for, it, for the particular factors that come up for you. But we can speak to you about your report and what's come up and the sorts of things that may be relevant at a local level and may be happening and you can, how you can start to address them in your action plan. The sustainability report is accompanied by a sustainability guide. It is not program specific. It is generic across a range of different scenarios, but again includes helpful examples of what other trusts have done when they have particular factors that come up in the sustainability report for them. So if it's senior leadership, what have they done about engaging their senior leaders within their programme? So as I say, our lead from NH Select will look at the sustainability report with you and start to help you develop some ideas that can be included in your action plan to address those particular areas. And just a reminder that we do this at the beginning of the programme and then we will also do this again towards the end of the programme. So you can see where your overall, overall school score has either increased or decreased and how the gap score between the maximum possible and your team score, how that has changed for various factors as well. So we've taken scores from some of our network programmes and sites that we've worked with, and we've aggregated them up to form a programme sustainability score, which gave us areas to focus on. When we did this with one of our network programmes and we aggregated it across a number of cohorts, it, for us, it came up with infrastructures, senior leadership, and the effectiveness of the system to monitor progress. So we sat down as a team to talk about why those elements came up for us across our, this network programme and what we could do to start to address them. For infrastructures, we looked at the website, what was included, what wasn't included, what we needed more examples of. We developed some more case study presentations. We looked at the content of our workshops. We developed virtual tours and films. We looked at how we connected up members from different parts of the network. And we looked at the experience of our team and whether there were any gaps there that we needed to fill. For senior leadership, we made sure that we put exec briefings in place so that our executive were fully informed about what was going on. As part of the project setup, we made sure that we engaged with the executive. So now as part of all of our site visits, we asked to meet with your executive lead for approximately 30 minutes or so at the beginning of the day so that they understand the program and how it operates and the intention and its aims. And so that we also understand where your improvement pro project and your involvement within the network fits within the strategic direction of the trust and how the exec sponsor understands that. We invite your senior leaders to the events that we do. We try to schedule verbal updates with them on a semi-regular basis so that they're aware of how things are progressing. And then from an external perspective and thinking about senior leadership from in that way, we made sure that the programmes that we're delivering were aligned with the national aims that were coming out from the centre. Finally, we had effectiveness of the system to monitor progress. So we went back, we looked at the measurement expertise we had in place. Were there any gaps there? What else did we need to do? We developed measurement tools, for example, around return on investment and experience based design. We looked at putting in place standard measures and what those potentially could be so that we could suggest those to our network members. 
We looked at the guidance we were providing around metrics, and we also stepped up our coaching on the seven steps to measurement. So that's included as part of all of our measurement masterclasses at the beginning of all of our programs now. So those are the actions that we took to address those three different factors that had come up to us when we looked at a particular network and aggregated up our cohort's sustainability scores. In conclusion, you need to include sustainability assessments as part of your project setup to ensure that your project is going to be as sustainable as possible in the long term. Make sure you get all the members of the team, but then other stakeholders as well to complete the questionnaire so that you're getting a truly representative result. We'll create the report based on those results that are created and discuss those results openly at your project meeting. They're all anonymised. We won't know and you won't know which members of staff have completed them and what their responses were. So feel free to use that report as part of your fortnightly project team meetings. If you've got a low score of less than 45, make sure that you strengthen those areas before you then start the project. And remember, it's just the top three where there is the greatest gap between the maximum score possible and the score that you've achieved. So between the actual and the potential, just focus on those three. Use the sustainability guide to help you formulate the items in your action plan, but also speak to our team here at NH Select. We have done this a large number of times with lots of different sites, lots of different trusts. Um, therefore, the issues that you're experiencing won't be necessarily new to us, and we may have some ideas and suggestions that other trusts have implemented to address them but then you can tailor them obviously to make it suitable for your own local environment. And then depending on how long your project is, you may want to reassess midway through, but we will definitely do a second round of sustainability towards the end of the programme, so we can see how you've moved and where you've moved to. And finally, how can we help? If you've any questions about the sustainability webinar today, or any questions generally around sustainability and how it fits within your improvement project, then if you're a member site, then please speak to your NH Select lead and they'll be happy to help you further or email in at the relevant email address. Depending on which programme you are part of, we can forward that email in the right direction and we'll be happy to help. Thanks ever so much for listening. Goodbye. <laughs>